Welcome to Evangelistic Outreach Ministries. The fields are white, all ready to harvest. For over half a century, the Evangelistic Outreach team has traveled across the street, about the nation, and around the world with the gospel message. We're dedicated to the vision of our late founder, Dr. Calvin Evans, to reach the unreached for Jesus Christ. May the love of Christ touch you, and may His Word teach you today on Evangelistic Outreach. We are really excited about this upcoming week. Calvin Ray and myself will be going to Moorhead, Kentucky for Winterfest Praise. It's going to be held at the Mount Pisgah Church in Moorhead, Kentucky on Bull Fork Road. We'll give you more information about the meeting here in just a moment. But we wanted to ask that you would join us in prayer as we ask God to bless this broadcast today. Father, we humbly come before you and we thank you for how you've already poured out your blessings upon us this year. Lord, as we have just been so overwhelmed with your love and with your grace, Lord, we just look forward to this week and how you're going to bless us and how we're going to just continue to worship you with many of our dear friends in the Moorhead, Kentucky area. I pray that you would bless Winterfest this week. I pray that you would bless those that will be traveling in to worship with us. Lord, for those that are sick today, those that are shut in and unable to get out to the house of God, I pray that the program today will just give them a little glimpse and a little taste and give them encouragement uh, that you're always there with them. And Lord, again, we thank you for being so good to us. Honor us with your presence today, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. A country where no twilight shadows deep
when at last we see the face of Jesus before whose image other Mike Blanton and Evidence, and they will be with us this week for Winterfest Praise in Moorhead, Kentucky. We're looking forward to being with many of our friends, and we hope that you will make plans to join us there at the Mount Pisgah Church. It's located on Bull Fork Road in Moorhead, Kentucky, and we're just looking for God to do great things. Mike Blanton and Evidence will be with us, as well as the Lore family, and then uh, Garrett and Kaylee Fitch will also be there as well. Calvin Ray, myself, Garrett Fitch, Mike Blanton, and possibly even Samuel, Darren, Lore. Uh, we're just looking for God to do great things, and we hope that you will join us. Again, if you need more information about this, you can go to our website at calvinevans.org, and all the information is there on our meetings page. And there you'll find information about the address. You'll also find information about the live streaming they have set up for the meeting. And so we encourage you to join us in person, but if you're unable to do that, you can always join us live on their YouTube channel. And again, all that information is available at calvinevans.org. And while you're there, go ahead and request this month's free gift offer. We thank you for the response we've been getting from the messages. Calvin Ray, at the beginning of the month, we've shared with you return, return. And then on last week's program, we share with you where have you laid him. These two messages are available on a DVD or an audio CD free of charge to you. And all you need to do is contact our ministry office. Again, there's no cost, no obligation whatsoever. You just need to make sure to contact us and we'll send it out to you free of charge. You can, again, call our office at 800-767-8713. You can also write to us at 299 Ohio Avenue, New Boston, Ohio, 45662. Or one of the easiest ways to do that is to go to Calvin Evans. Dot org. Again, thank you for standing with us. And today we're going to be going to a message that Calvin Ray preached from uh, a couple of years ago from Winterfest. And we hope it's a blessing to you today. I'm going to read just a few verses to you tonight out of Deuteronomy chapter 1. And of course, a uh, very familiar passage of scripture. When we get to the first chapter of Deuteronomy, we realize this is the time where the, uh, the journey is now ended. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They, are, they have come to a place, according to verse two, called Kadesh Barnea. And there at Kadesh Barnea, they are standing on the brink of the promised land. 
They're waiting on God's instructions on what to do next. And God gives them that direction. And the Lord makes it very clear to them. In the sixth verse, the Bible says, the Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, you have dwelt long enough in this mount, turn you and take your journey, and go to the mount of the Amorites, and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. But then the strange statement occurs in verse 26. God has told them, this is the land that I promised to your fathers. This is the land that you can go in and possess it. Now I want you to enter in. Don't stay here any longer. Turn, go and enter into the land. But verse 26 says, notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your heart, in your tents, and said, because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt. Isn't that a statement to make? After being a slave in Egypt, and now God's delivered them and said, God must have delivered us because he hated us. But that's not why he brought them forth at all. He delivered them out of the hands of the Amorites, not to destroy them as they thought. But the Bible says in verse 28, whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there, which were giants, of course. Now, let me just give you just a little brief summary of what's happening in this particular passage. They have now come out of bondage. Egypt is a type of the world. They have now passed through the sea. They are now set free from the enemy. Their enemy is behind them. They come to Kadesh Barnea, and God says, I've set before you a gateway into the promised land. Now let me pause and say this. You may disagree with me, and I don't want to start an argument with you. A lot of people have sung it. A lot of people have talked about it, where they feel like that the promised land is like unto heaven. But the promised land to the children of Israel is not a type of heaven. Do you know why? Because there were still enemies in the promised land that they had to conquer. May I remind you, when we get to heaven, there are no more devils to fight. There are no more problems. There are no more curse. There is no, nothing there that we'll have to possess. There'll be no darkness. There'll be no pain. We'll live free from all of those things. So it can't be a type of heaven. But I tell you what I do believe that it is a type of. It is a type of victory. They are standing at the edge of victory. And God says, if you want, go up and possess it, and I'll give you victory. But they said, we will not go up. Do you realize three times at least in the word of God, they came to this exact same place, Kadesh Barnea, and all three times they had an opportunity to enter in. The first time that we read about it in the word of God, we read about it there in Numbers chapter 13. And when they came, the people rebelled. They looked at the, at the cities, they looked at the size of the giants that were there, and the people rebelled and said, we won't go. The next time you read about it, you come to number 16. This time, a man by the name of Korah has 250 princes that has risen up against Moses. And they say that they're not going in, and they rise up against Moses. And when they rise up against Moses, the end result was the earth opened up and swallowed them and swallowed the 250 princes, Korah and his entire crowd. But again, they rebelled and did not go in. The final time, we have Moses, the leader. He is there and, and he's, he's there before God. And God says in Numbers 20 that the people were without water and God said, speak to the rock. And of course, Moses didn't speak to the rock. What did he do? He smote the rock. And God said, you rebelled against me. And Moses, now you're not going to enter into the promised land. You'll get to see it, but you'll not enter into it. So all three times, they were on the edge of finding victory. But all three times, they rebelled against what God wanted in their life. 
And any time you rebel against God, you're not going to have victory. See, they came out of Egypt, but yet when they had the greatest blessing in front of them, they refused to go where God wanted them to go. It is a picture of rebellion. And oftentimes people do not realize it, but when God directs us in anything, whether he touches your heart to be saved and you refuse to accept that, you're in rebellion against God because God's saying it's not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But when you refuse to come to God, you can say, well, I'm not against God. If you're not for him, you are against him. Rebellion. And here we see them three times. Why does God allow them to come on three occasions to step into victory? And really that's the essence of this whole message, stopping short of victory in God. It's so easy to get right to the edge of victory, but stop short of what God really wants for us. Why did they do that? Why didn't they enter in? Can I tell you three simple reasons why I believe they didn't enter in? First of all, I believe they didn't enter in on the first occasion because they were satisfied. They were satisfied with the present. See, they were happy just getting out of Egypt and they didn't want anything else. They were satisfied that God had brought them out, but they did not want to go in to what God wanted them to go into. They said getting out of Egypt is good enough for us, so I I just wanna stay where I'm at. The problem was this, God had brought them out of Egypt, but they didn't have Egypt out of them. I'm glad for all three amens. Probably die off right here. There's some people that I've met in my Christian walk that really when you meet them, they're constantly living like these these Israelites were living. It's almost like they wish they were still in sin. They act like Christianity is a burden. They act like that they love Egypt more than what God is leading them into. That's why they still long for Egypt. That's why they talk about Egypt. That's why they'd rather live in Egypt than to live for God. They'd rather live like the world, act like the world. They really love the world more than they love the promises of God. But my friend, God has greater things for us than just bringing us out of Egypt. I'm telling you, I don't feel at home in this world ever since the Lord saved me. God did something in my life and I don't think that you're happy with where you came from. I don't have to sit around and tell you what I used to be. I'd rather tell you, thank God I'm not that anymore. I'm not the person that I used to be because God brought me out of Egypt Egypt, and God also wants to bring us into victory. I think that you can be happy serving the Lord. I don't think it's a burden to love the Lord. I don't think it's a burden to do what God wants you to do. I don't think it's work. I don't think it's a chore. I don't think it's a hardship. I think it's a blessing to step into the victory that God gives us. So number one, I think that they were satisfied. As long as you are satisfied doing nothing else for God, you'll do nothing else for God. If you are satisfied with your present condition, you you can go as far with God as you want to go. You read your Bible last week as much as you wanted to read your Bible. You prayed as much as you wanted to pray. You go to church as much as you want to go to church. I realize sometimes sickness and other things hinder us, but I also realize there's a lot of people that just do not have the joy of stepping into victory. Praise God. Feel a little lonely up here tonight, but notwithstanding the Lord, still with me. Amen. But yet... We can't long for this world and love this world and have victory in our heart. It's a personal decision that we have to make. Number two, I think the reason that they didn't go in was plain and simple. They were scared of the people. It looked too much for them. It looked too big for them. It looked like something greater than they could accomplish by themselves. They couldn't see themselves defeating giants. 
They couldn't see themselves coming up to walled cities and walled cities falling before them. And when they got to thinking about all of that, it scared them. Amen. Has God ever brought you to the edge of something when you looked at your abilities and you looked at the tasks that God set before you? Amen. You knew you'd have great victory if you did it, but yet when you looked at it, you just had to say, I'm scared to step into that. A lot of you, the reason that you haven't turned your life over the Lord, you can say what you want to because you're scared of certain people. You wonder how you're gonna tell certain people you work with, certain friends you have, certain family members. You're scared of what you'll say to them after that you accept Christ as your savior or else you're scared of their response to you, that they may cut you off, that they may not want anything to do with you anymore. And you know what? I hope that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. Sometimes they'll look at you and say, if you're following the Lord, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to communicate with you anymore. I'm cutting you out of my life. I've seen people get saved and they no longer get to go to their family gatherings because the family doesn't want them there. They think they're a fanatic. They think they're crazy. But remember that old song, though the world doesn't go with them, I'm still going to follow Jesus. If nobody else goes, you've got to make up your mind. If your husband or wife don't go, I've got to see the Lord. I've got to make heaven my home. I've got to serve God. If the whole world turns their back on Jesus, let's make sure that we're following him. Scared. Scared. Scared to tell people. You say, well, why would anybody be scared? Well, have you seen the reaction of this ungodly world today to Christians? They hate us. They despise us. They don't like what we, what we have. They, they, they'll say things like, you think you're better than everybody else. No, I think Jesus is better than everybody else. And I just wanna follow him and please him. And we've gotta make up our mind that we're gonna follow him no matter what the world does. But finally, finally, I think that they didn't go in to victory and stop short of victory, not only because they were satisfied with the present and scared of the people, but I think they were skeptical of the promise of God. They could believe God for some things, but couldn't believe God for other things. Amen. They could believe God as long as God was sending plagues, but when those plagues come, it didn't touch them. There were no flies in Goshen. There was no fear of death for those who had the covering of the blood. Amen. It was touching others, but not touching them. We can believe God for that. We can believe God when we get on the other side of the sea and the enemy has collapsed and the chariots and horses are now gone. We can believe God for that. They could believe God to get them out of Egypt. They couldn't believe God to take them into the promised land. Amen. Now, here's a thought that crossed my mind. When you've been doing this as long as I've been doing it in 42 years of preaching, what I'm about to say sums up the modern church in America today. People want to trust God with their soul, but they don't want to trust God with their life. In other words, Lord, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want you messing with my life. I don't want you bothering my plans. I want to do what I want to do. And Lord, if you fit into it some way, that's just fine. I'll put a social media post up how good you are and praise you for it and go on. But if it interrupts my plans, then Lord, I'd just as soon you leave me alone. I'll trust you with my soul I don't want to trust you with my life. Amen. But if we really want to step into victory, we've got to trust God with our all. When I was studying for this sermon, for some reason I, I couldn't get my mind off of Mary and her alabaster box. You remember that? She brought that alabaster box. In fact, the Bible says how much the precious ointment was worth. If you do a study on it, you'll find... Almost everyone agrees it was probably worth, at that time, at least one year's salary, the ointment that was in that. Probably came from India. It was known as the ointment of the kings. Kings were known to have that particular ointment. And because of the long journey, 
and the hazards in getting it there, it was one of the most precious ointments of the day. But my question that kept running through my mind, how did she get that? Amen. She was a prostitute before she met the Lord. I don't want to offend anybody, but the word of God's the word of God. Amen. She made her living in sin before she met Jesus. And I, I was wondering, what's this woman doing with a box of ointment that's so valuable? And in Jewish traditions, I only found three possible areas that it could be. I'm not gonna to pretend to say which one it was, but it may have been all three of them. Number one, sometimes, sometimes girls, if they were an only daughter, a father of an only child that was a daughter sometimes had such high hopes for that child that one of the greatest gifts he would give her is, is an alabaster box with this ointment in it. Well, as we come to the close of the program today, thank you for joining us week after week. I do have a tremendous favor to ask out of you. I hope that you'll tell others, close friends and family, and those even in your church about the program, what time that it airs in your area, and encourage them to tune into Evangelistic Outreach too. We are so thankful that God is allowing this ministry to increase year after year. And the way that happens is through your prayers, through your support, and by you sharing the program with others. So please encourage them to do that. And then too, don't forget this week is the big week of Winterfest, the meeting down at Moorhead, Kentucky at Mount Pisgah Church. We look forward to that. I hope you'll join us there. We have a great time there in worship every year, and we look forward to seeing you there in that meeting if you live in the area around Moorhead, Kentucky. Until next week, may God bless you. Thank you for joining us today on Evangelistic Outreach Ministries. The fields are white, already to harvest. For more information about this ministry, contact us at Evangelistic Outreach Ministries, 299 Ohio Avenue, New Boston, Ohio, 45662, or toll free at 800-767-8713. You can also visit us online at calvinevans.org.